Realism is an often stupidly and poorly debated topic in gaming, especially when it comes to first person shooters. Those are Americans. Nice. A lot of people like to feel like the experience they have in a game mirrors an actual experience in real life. Milsim communities are run almost entirely off the concept that a bunch of dudes on computers want to LARP as soldiers and act out war over the internet. There's also a lot of discussion about historical accuracy and the use of certain weapons, equipment, and demographics, especially when it comes to historical games. And then someone else will mention the ability to respawn, then I have to dress up as a referee and blow a whistle at him, and it's just kind of embarrassing for everyone. There's a few common problems I keep seeing in these discussions, and I want to dig in a little and figure out what arguments we should stick with. I trust this guy. He knows what the fuck's going on right now. I have no idea. And which ones deserve to die, realistically. Oh, he does not. He does not know what's going on right now. What's he peeking? Like, we There's a... The arguing over realism comes down to one basic misunderstanding. Realism is different from authenticity, and that's different from consistency. Let's start with authenticity. What does authenticity mean? The quality of being auth- Oh, for fuck! Authentic means made or done in the traditional or original way, or in a way that faithfully resembles an original. Obviously, the line here is not going to be completely clear. Take something like SWAT 4. It's not realistic. I find it highly unlikely any police SWAT unit in the United States would allow their officers to go on call with a full-size Colt Python, or import a G36 so they could load black tips into it, or send in five officers to clear a building full of armed terrorists. But it's such a legendary game because it is authentic. Each mission starts with a radio call from a dispatcher and a briefing for your team. Will be Optionally, you can listen to initial 911 calls, and different intel given is dependent on the circumstances. For one mission, you get a rough layout of the map drawn on a napkin from an employee, and in the first level, the layout for the house is given, but the basement is an estimation since it was built after it was purchased. None of these details are super core to the gameplay loop, but they help draw you into the experience and feel like you're experiencing something close to reality. But that stuff is realistic, so let's use an example from something that is objectively not realistic. Battlefield 1 is a game set in World War 1. Let's put aside for a moment that war in World War 1 looked like this and the gameplay looks like this. The game features a submachine gun called the MP18. This weapon is absolutely real and it was produced and distributed by Germany during World War 1. The thing is though, something like 10,000 of them were distributed and according to estimates around 4,000 of them saw combat. This is in a war where over 2 million Germans died. These things were what the kids call phantom tax. There's no hope left. So seeing them field as a primary weapon for most soldiers in a match isn't at all realistic. But, considering the weapon's place in history, it is authentic. It belongs. Unless you're a scholar of the time, it's not going to stick out to you. As a counterexample, Call of Duty Vanguard is a game set in World War II. A war with lots of interesting weapons. Bolt action rifles, Thompson submachine guns, BARs, and a lot more. But Call of Duty Vanguard came out in the 2020s, which means it has battle passes, and it needs to continuously put new weapons on that battle pass. So they, uh... They... They threw in a fucking laser rifle. When do you get energy weapons? That's nerd stuff. But that's so goofy, it almost doesn't even offend me. Here's what does. The FN F2000 is a playable weapon in Call of Duty Vanguard. The F2000 was released in 2001. I am older than the F2000. Splinter Cell, a game from 2002, used the F2000 for its protagonist's primary weapon in order to make his equipment seem more futuristic. Half the century after World War II ended, the F2000 was considered futuristic. This weapon just doesn't belong here. But authenticity can change depending on the project. Stalker Gamma is a massive mod pack for another Stalker mod, Stalker Anomaly. I don't want to get into it. One of its unique features, fresh from its creator Grok, is its medical system. Limbs and the overall body have separate health, allowing for crippling of those limbs, and different items heal different things. For example, a medical kit will heal limbs and health, while a tourniquet will only work on arms and legs. Pain medications are used to post-heal, which allows the limb healing to become permanent. But uh, here's, here's the, the thing. thing, that's not how healing works at all. Here's an example. My character gets shot in the chest and the arm. He pulls out a Russian medkit and injects a painkiller. This heals his chest and arm. He's still bleeding, so he throws the tourniquet on his arm and then injects some fentanyl for those sweet post heals. He'll feel sick for a while, but then he'll be ready to rock in a few minutes. If someone did this in real life, they would, first of all, probably not stop the bleeding. Second of all, possibly OD on those painkillers if they didn't lose them through the bleeding. And thirdly, lose their fucking arm because tourniquets are meant to get you to a medic, not stay on your body permanently. But this is not an attack on the game. Because do you know what real healing from combat looks like? This. You don't heal by sticking yourself with a bunch of drugs. You heal by resting, allowing time to pass, and having professionals make ongoing decisions about your treatment. The point of the healing system in the game isn't to accurately model real life healing. It's there to give you a resource to manage. What do you buy? Where do you get it? When do you use it? Fits the setting and it feels authentic. Tourniquets aren't used to stop minor bleeds, but they are used in combat. So when you take a round and duck behind a bus stop to wrap one around your arm, you're creating a moment that feels like it could happen. To take this argument even further, Receiver is a game where you wander around picking up notes and shooting robots. Fairly simple, right? Um, not really. The gunplay in this game is the most complex I have ever seen. Not because of in-depth movement, recoil management, or uber-tactical decision-making. Because of realism. 
Just about every individual action required to use a firearm is its own keybind and works the way you would expect. If you want to lock your slide back, you need to press the button to pull it back, you need to hold the slide lock, and you need to let go of the slide. If you want to reload a revolver, you need to open the cylinder, take out the spent rounds, put in new ones, and close the cylinder. And if you want to decock it, you better hold the hammer, pull the trigger, then release the hammer. If people had analog keyboards, you bet they'd make you slowly let go of the key too. Clearly, there's an upper limit of realism where it stops serving immersion and becomes overbearing. Again, I'm not attacking receiver, that's the point of the game. But if Call of Duty had receiver's gunplay, the player base would collectively lose their fucking mind. But, alternatively, here's where the it doesn't matter crowd goes a little too far. Just because realism doesn't matter, that doesn't mean consistency doesn't matter. Not every game wants to be taken seriously, but if it does, it needs to follow its own rules so the player can believe in its world. I can think of no better example than the new Modern Warfare trilogy. Let's look at the most remembered level for Modern Warfare 2019, Clean House. This mission is a simple raid of a terrorist cell in London. And without context, you could be fooled into thinking this is a level from an alternate universe where Rainbow Six was still a series about counterterrorism operations. Considering the Golden Path achievement requirements, some of the tactics implicitly encouraged in this level can be... questionable. You still have to clear almost every room completely by yourself, but without a doubt, this mission feels real. But that's making it too easy. Let's go to something less realistic, but still believable. In Modern Warfare 2, We're not doing this joke. There's a level called Alone, where you have to sneak around a town in Mexico while Shadow Company hunts for you. This PMC is presumably populated by ex-special forces, and they are supposed to be an elite threat. Yet one SAS operator can clear dozens of them while remaining undetected? This level isn't realistic, but it's believable in the universe it takes place in. Die Hard has gunfights, but John McClane usually has the element of surprise and he outsmarts his opponents just as much or more often than he outshoots them. This level has a scripted gunfight, but the best course of action is to run and hide as soon as it's over. Like I said, not realistic, but consistent. Now on to Activision's latest failed DLC video game, Modern Warfare 3 has no respect for its aesthetic 90 plus percent of the time. Warzone's mechanics were built for a multiplayer shooter, and they prioritize things like freedom of movement and increasing time to kill over looking cool and being consistent. But when I'm in a story that's supposedly taking itself seriously, and I'm shoving three sappy plates into one vest and base jumping across shipyards, open orange loot crates with colored tears for some fucking reason, my issue isn't that it's not realistic, it's that it's really fucking stupid. This and this are not congruent. Enough about COD, let's talk about Squad. When it comes to multiplayer games, sometimes the fight is between believability, playability, and incentivizing player behavior. Recently, the game had an infantry combat overhaul, which greatly increased the time it takes for your character to settle their sight picture, jacked up the recoil, and revamped suppression to be much more debilitating. These effects were controversial to say the least, many attacking it for its lowering of the skill ceiling and lack of realism. I'm not an amazing shot, but I can absolutely hit a man-sized target with an M4 at 100 meters faster than a squad character in the first iteration of the ICO. But I would argue that it achieved what it set out to do. Yes, the gunplay is worse feeling, but it's better looking, and more importantly, it pushes players to work together, use suppressing fire, and take their time. You can argue whether or not the trade-off is worth it, but the pros and cons are clear to see. Some of the most fun I've had in squad was the tense time between raising an anti-tank launcher and waiting for my sight picture to settle so I could punch a hole in a BTR. Do you know the name of the munition this hell can cannon fires this? It says, and I'm not fucking with you right now, the blessed propane tank. Like I said, lots of decisions around realism involve trying to incentivize behaviors or thought processes. Getting characters killed in the older Rainbow Six games was permanent, and eventually you could get worked down to shitty generic teammates, which is a really cool way to give negative performance feedback. Okay, I need you to believe me when I say this. I wrote all of that before I saw this video. Moidog had an interview with the lead game designer for Squad, and I lost my shit when I watched this. Squad can be very realistic, but there are also aspects of Squad that are gamey, like in in the real world, you don't get blurry vision, you don't have desaturated uh, <laughs> eyesight whenever you get shot at. Um, why were those mechanics implemented? Um, and additionally, now, maybe a couple months later, have those results of the mechanics um, been what you wanted? So I think the key word to focus on when we're talking about this kind of stuff is authenticity. Yeah, so we focus on authenticity. So that doesn't mean everything is going to be 100% realistic. Like, we're not trying to be a simulator. So the whole game is going to be made up of a combination of mechanics that might be, you know, very true to life and some that might not be true to life, as long as they create that authentic experience we're going for. So, like, with suppression, when you get shot at in real life, your your vision doesn't go blurry and, you know, you don't get desaturation in your field of view or whatever. <laughs> Um, but what we're trying to represent is like the fear that a real person has when they get shot at. Mm. So even though we can't recreate that fear, uh, what we can do is 
incentivize the player or encourage them to behave in a similar manner. It's an unrealistic input, but you get a realistic output. Obviously, this doesn't prove my perspective right, but I'm clearly not the only person with it, and whether you consider the ICO a success or not, I think it's inarguable that if the goal was to push players to use suppression, lengthen firefights, and make the game more cinematic, it definitely accomplished its goals. Let me loop back to Tarkov. Some players have long requested the ability to cook grenades and escape from Tarkov. The following is completely hearsay at this point, so keep that in mind. Allegedly, the head dev for the project explained why he wouldn't add it to the game. His reasoning was apparently something like you would never do that in real life, which is probably true. I can attest that you're taught in the US Army to never cook a grenade. The manual for the grenades even says not to. Do not attempt to cook off or milk the grenade. <laughs> yeah, get fucking army pubs did. But then the obvious counter argument enters the conversation. But you could, and people probably have. There are multiple good reasons to not let them cook, as it were. The first and most obvious one, it eliminates counterplay. Once the cook nade hits you, you're fucking dead. Impact nade shouldn't be in the game for the same reason. And the better version of Nikita's argument, it doesn't fit the aesthetic of the game as intended. PMCs in Tarkov are characters with a backstory. Part of that backstory is professional training that would tell them not to do that. I think that's not important personally, but I do think it's a good decision, and more importantly, you can't just say no -uh to it. Then we have Rainbow Six Siege. The removal of frag grenades on certain operators has been extremely controversial because of the frag being extremely powerful compared to other secondary gadgets. Cooking grenades in Siege allows for instantly killing opponents through floors. Up the whistle. Op 4 eliminated. Oh, he While this is a great form of skill expression, it's infinitely more powerful than something like a flashbang. So Ubisoft removed the ability to cook grenades. If you look for community sentiment on this, most people will just say Ubisoft sucks lol. Or they mention lowering of the skill gap, which is fair. But if you look just a bit lower, you'll find this. Yeah, the grenades update is dumb actually. Who even thought to change that? Like IRL, you can cook them and now we can't? Like, I don't get it. You make majority of the attackers one health, now we can the gadgets to accommodate defense? Great! Firstly, you'll notice the grammar quality of the people making this argument. Secondly, this is a great example showing that the realism argument just doesn't work. The obvious counter to this is, you think Siege is realistic? Then you get into arguments about weapon ballistics, wall destruction, nanomachines, and Master Chief. As soon as realism gets thrown into the conversation, it immediately derails any usefulness that conversation could have had. If you want to argue for this change, mention that it doesn't have counterplay and it makes frags overpowered. If you want to argue against it, say that it allows for skilled players to use the game's destruction in unique ways and that it raises the skill ceiling. Do not, I say again, do not mention whether it's possible in reality or not. And while we're discussing derailment, the realism argument has one other use. As a straw man, FaZe member makes a tweet, annoyed that players can dive underwater to avoid damage from gunfire in Warzone. Please look into the water. It seems when they dive to a certain distance, you can no longer shoot them. Gamers discover bullet physics. For real though, this is kind of lame for a COD game. Pro Reborn here simultaneously dunks on the tweet and agrees with it. Very nice. Lame. So where do you want to pick and choose the realism? If you're out in the open and get behind a tree or rock, you can't be hit. That's realistic. But if you're out in the water and don't want to be able to dive deep enough to not be hit, which is actually realistic, this person is attacking Pro Reborn because presumably he thinks trees should be usable as cover, but water shouldn't. Except here's the problem. So where do you want to pick and choose realism? Um, let's rub our G Fuel addled brain cells together. Why would we want realism in one facet? but not in another. Could it be? We were talking about balance and gameplay and realism has nothing to do with the conversation at all? There are two sides of this argument. The person diving under the water can only stay there a limited time and they have limited offensive options. On the other hand, perhaps the water should function as effective concealment and the risk reward of the water when it's shootable could be trading the ability to easily take cover with the ability to move quickly with extremely effective concealment. This discussion can be had, but realism is just a hand grenade you throw in as a cheap jab so you don't have to engage with the discussion. First, they cry about COD not having realism. Realism is added. They call the realism lame. You can't win with this community. This one's a classic. Everyone in a group is responsible for the opinions of everyone else in the group, so they're all hypocrites at all times by default. Yes, it is impossible for developers to please different people with incompatible desires simultaneously. I agree. Thank you for your valuable input. So what does this mean when discussing realism and authenticity in games? Well, first of all, think about the experience you want. What kind of language you're going to use to convey it? Do you want to feel like a soldier making difficult decisions that can change the outcome of a battle? Or do you want to spend 10 hours learning every nuance on how to operate a fighter jet? It's okay to want the fighter jet thing. Just know what you're expecting and what the creator is trying to accomplish. What level of training is your character meant to have? And how much abstraction is required for you to be able to perform at their level? The language around realism has become so loaded that you're setting your own argument up for a straw man by using it in the wrong context, even if your intentions are completely reasonable. This isn't the first time a word in the English language has been distorted to work against its users. It definitely won't be the last. Convincing random people on Twitter to show the same courtesy will probably be impractical, so I'm just gonna have to wish you good luck with that one. If you think someone else is wrong, apply the same process in reverse. How does their viewpoint conflict with what you perceive as the intended experience? 
Games that combine genres are especially prone to this issue because they're pulling ideas from different design philosophies, which may be mutually exclusive. So figuring out which ones to use and which ones to leave on the table takes a lot of deliberation. If all the ideas from a certain genre offends you, then maybe the game's not for you. You don't have to play everything, especially when games are more expensive than ever. You've seen how low we can go in these arguments. The whole point of tactical and simulation games is that they're cerebral, so you might expect the same level of intelligence to be applied when talking about them. Am I cherry picking the worst ones? Sure. But if talking about this weren't so fucking infuriating, I wouldn't need to make this video to begin with. I'm not gonna lie, at least 20% of my motivation to create this was to be able to send it to morons instead of arguing with them on the internet. If you're a moron I sent this to on the internet, holy shit, you watched this? I hope this video was able to help some of you navigate these conversations in the future, and if not, I'm sure it was at least cathartic for some of you to hear someone who shares your perspective. And no matter how stupid your opinions, thank you for watching. Special thanks to Icarus Gaming for helping me talk through the script and writing a part of it. Thank you to my channel members, this is what I spent your money on. And as always, subscribe to my fucking YouTube channel.